Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Alexandra Faust. Uh, Alexandra is a staff research scientist at Google Brain Robotics. Before Google uh, Brain, Alexandra worked at Waymo as well as Sandia National Labs. Uh, she got her master's at, AU, at UIUC and followed by her PhD at University of Mexico, where she also won the best doctoral dissertation award. Um, Alexandra is interested, broadly interested, I would say, in uh, machine learning for safe, scalable, and socially aware uh, motion planning and decision making. Um, her research has been um, advertised in several media outlets, including New York Times, PC Magazine, uh, and she also won the Best Paper in Service Robotics uh, Award at ICRA last year. Uh, so welcome, Alexandra. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming here. Everybody can hear me? So today I'm going to share our current progress on task and motion planning, mostly in the context of navigation, but lots of these techniques should transfer to general motion planning. Today in the United States, there are 11 million people that can't leave their homes without some sort of assistive device. That is combined population in the New York City and Los Angeles. Three and a half million people, or the entire state of Connecticut, never leaves their home. Service robots are robots that, autonomous robots that run errands, bring groceries, uh, help these people can make huge difference in their lives. That's a tremendous opportunity for robotics to make difference for people that matter. But what do we mean by that? What do we need? With navigation at scale on real robots in real world, right? Now these are the big wor words and what does that mean? So let's look. So here we have, oops, we don't have, uh, let's see, uh, now we're in business. So we have a fetch robot going from, what's going on? <laughs> okay, we're back. The going, executing the same task, going from one side of the room towards the sink, rolling the camera over, five, 10 minute period. And these are the changes in the room that happen. So it's blocked, this person is coming in. The, the, on, the, on the first shot, the entry to the sink was open. The robot must navigate and plan online. Now there's a janitor coming here in a way that needs to avoid it and so on. That's the real world, right? Robots need to be able to go from A to B dealing with anything. So it starts there, the path opens and goes this way. They need to deal with this stuff. By the way, this is reinforcement learning policy running on the robot, no tricks or anything. So the rest of the talk is gonna be <laughs> <laughs> partially how we got there. The second thing is real robots, right? They all come in different shapes and sizes. They have different sensors. They have different dynamics. They have uh, different geometries. Fetch robot here is 250 pounds, maximum speed three miles an hour. Running into you is kind of equivalent of the football player hitting you, which is not a pleasant thing to do. Hello. The little brother Freight has different sensors because it does not have camera on the top. It's 100 pounds lighter because it doesn't have the body, and, the, and yet it is uh, twice as fast, which kind of makes the whole dynamics business harder. We have the little crazy fly there that has a whole 200 kilobytes of memory to work with and so on. The cars, uh, the racer car has a different dynamics and so on. So that's the real robots. We generally want to have methods that work for given robot and plan safe and feasible motion in real world. So the standard, the standard stack, <laughs> okay, very good. So the standard stack that consists of perception, motion planning, and control generally does not scale well. And the reason is because the integration is hard. You have the planning layer that does not know about the errors on the perception layer, the control layer does not know about the errors on the planning layer, and then for every single robot and every single environment, we spend lots of time engineering and fixing bugs and compensating from the layer above. That's not scalable. So how do we get to a scalable part? Well, if we borrow a book from the biological systems, just as an inspiration, right? In biological systems, inputs and outputs remain the same. 
We observe the world with our senses and we express ourselves with emotion, language and so on, but let's kind of keep, kind of keep just to the, to the motion and this side. Regardless what task and what we're trying to do, it's always same input and same output. And the focus is around the curriculum of skill and building the curriculum of skills, right? So can we do something similar to scale up robotics? Biological system, we have evolution. First comes evolution, evolution determines the parameters of the system that enable learning, right? Do I have the right sensors? Do I have the right uh, arms, legs, and whatnot to accomplish the tasks that are needed to be accomplished? Then once we have the system, then we interact with the environment to learn how to navigate. That's my daughter learning to walk. <laughs> The, and we learn to navigate, <laughs> I know after several inter repetitions it becomes mean. <laughs> Finally, after we learn the skill, we reflect on it. We reflect on how well we're able to do something where we can improve and we're able to predict given a new situation, new task, how well or how feasible that task is gonna be, and we can use that in a higher order planning to improve our overall skill set. And finally, we have the curriculum of these skills that kind of takes us to the proficiency. So in the context of navigation and task planning, what is the most basic skill? What is the first thing we can learn that will kind of serve as a building block for the rest of it. So we had, we saw it there. It's going to the sink. If I ask you guys, one of you to come here to the stage, you don't need to know why you're here. You don't need to know how you got here, right? All you need to know is to fight, to get to this stage dealing whatever needs to be dealt with, right? Or you need to be able to exit the room Again, dealing with whatever needs to be done. That's a transferable skill. You can come to a stage in any stage, right? You, <laughs> you can exit the room at any room and so on. So if you invest our time learning something like that, which we call point to point or steering function or controller or goal condition policy, however you're gonna call it, that's one basic building block. The key here to say is that this policy comes, goes maps directly sensors to controls and works with the noisy sensors, noisy controls, and noisy localization. So we're gonna call this point-to-point -point policy. Since we're learning the sequence of actions, reinforcement learning is a natural setup. So we have our fetch robot. It has some observations. These are the noisy LIDAR observations. Basically white means you can go, covers 220 degrees. Black means there is an obstacle here and then this is noise that's present. We feed three observations in it. The actions are twist commands, so linear and angular velocity of the center of the mass. And we train in a small static environment. It's one of the Google micro kitchens with no walls moving and, or no obstacles moving, but it's just static obstacles. The, we feed the map and then we grow the walls. However, the goal here is, the objective here is to reach the goal. That's sparse, and if you ever try to do reward search and so on shaping, it's not easy, <laughs> as it seems to be. We do have a good intuition of what might be the good parameters for the reward, but what the particular weights and so on, it's not clear. So there's lots of engineering that needs to go into that. The second area that where an engineer needs to come is deciding what this neural network architecture looks like, how many layers, how wide they are, and so on. And by large, we do that by trial and error. And it's a painful process. Training this on DDPG takes about 12 hours, so that kind of extends very quickly. So what can, can we do better? And this is just an example of a reward search being hard. This is hand-tuned policy with a reward, the robot goes to a goal, but the motion is not optimal. <laughs> it goes and swirls around. Okay, so we're gonna combine the evolutionary algorithms with reinforcement learning 
to automate reinforcement learning, and it's going to work in two steps. In first step, we're going to first evolve the rewards until we find the reward that enables the system to learn the task, and then we're going to fix the reward and vary or evolve the neural network architecture. So I'm going to start with a population of agents. Each agent has slightly different reward. We're after they're done training, we evaluate these policies against the task, task objective, how successful they are or not. We then select mutation for the next agent to start and select the current best policy. We do this for 1,000 agents, running 100 at a time, and we have the reward. Then we repeat the process. Now we have the fixed reward, same population of agents, but now we're wearing the neural network architecture in it, and we produce a neural network architecture. This takes about a week to train. Each one is 12 hours, so do the math, it ends up being about a week. It is also equivalent of 32 years of real-time training of the experience. So it's not cheap. On the robot, however, so this is the training environment, very simple, just the raised walls and so on. The objective is to reach the goal. This is the DPG in this case. And the reward is something to the effect of reaching the goal and avoiding obstacles, so the distance orientation and so on. And it does a direct transfer to the real world. We put it here on the robot and put it with the avoiding obstacles. My dog had a really good time that day. <laughs> Lots of treats. The, but what's interesting here is I'm blocking. It's trying to go behind me, turns around, right? and loops back and is going to go and find the wall. This was not trained. It was basically just trying to figure out, trying to find a way to, to get to that goal position. This is the freight, basically running the same policy, going twice as fast between these obstacles and kind of stop, stopping in time and so on. It was trained on a specific map, right? This would, yeah, it was trained on that little micro kitchen, which was 20 meters by 15 meters or so. And the idea is that we can invest time into one skill and then can be transferable to other environments. In the, and basically, we want to minimize the complexity of that training environment, so finding a minimum training environment that is going to accomplish the task. In the, yeah, you're familiar with this. <laughs> the, Okay, so we compare then with the classic approaches and with hand-tuned rewards. And basically, classic approaches are really good producing the optimal motion, even behavior cloning. It's going to produce smooth trajectories. But the moment we start adding noise to the sensors, to the localization, it's going to start degrading. The reinforcement learning policies actually handle noise really well across the board, but the motion might not be optimal. And as the, as the policy learns and matures, and we had a whole paper on that, we actually find that there are phases that it goes through, and it starts with kind of being very conservative, then it be becomes very optimistic and bullish, and then becomes conservative, so goes through these phases. And finding the actually the right reward gets you faster to where you need to be in to accomplish the task. Fine, work for robots. Now let's see if it works for Mujeko. Normally, people go from Mujeko to robots, we go the other way around. <laughs> so we showed that it worked on DDPG for the sparse goal here being the, the robot got there or not. We're looking now on the soft actor critic and PPO and across the four Mujeko environments and two task objectives that we're looking. One is the simple one. The idea here is that we can put the task that we can define tasks very easily. I want this humanoid to maximize the distance traveled. Right? That, that, that should be the, the award. The other is the multi-objective. This is the reward that we gave, that basically Mujako environment has, that has several things combined together in it. And then we want to vary the reward in these Mujako environments the weights that are fixed there and try to see if we can find a better parameterization that is going to accomplish the task. Our baselines here is green one is the baselines, OpenAI general baselines that are published there. 
blue one is hyperparameter tuned, so we vary the learning rate and the discount factor and all that sort of stuff. And then out RL is the orange one. This is very easy environment. Out RL does not do much there for you. But humanoid task, which is the most complex one, you actually had a huge bump in performance. And the intuition here is that the more complex task is, the worse we are finding a hand-tuned solution, so maybe we should automate it. And this is the video. This is the soft actor critic. Basically, it learned to run for the, for the humanoid. And this is the baselines and the hyperparameter tuned. The second question we ask is, okay, we had the complex task objective that somebody spent time engineering, or we can use the simple one. Let's assume that we really care about this complex thing. Can we train and run the out RL optimizing for the simple distance traveled objective and measure against the more complex one? Does that make sense? All right. So the light red one is trained for standard reward, so basically this complex objective. It's trained for that and evaluated on it. The dark red one is trained for the distance covered simple task objective and then evaluated over the standard reward. There's a gap in performance there, but it's tiny. What is, I guess I'm not sure, what is the complex task that you're talking about? So the complex task is basically the reward that's already given in Mojako environment and that, that it has four terms. One is the distance traveled and I guess the penalty for falling and so on. What's really weird about this result is that we're using task objective. I was talking to somebody earlier about that. That we're using the task objective that has fixed rewards and we're basically reparameterizing the reward. And that gives boost in performance. And that really stumped me and we dug deeper <laughs> and basically I was claiming math is wrong. <laughs> it's not going to work because it shouldn't. The reason is that basically it finds a different path in the reward space. And the reparameterization of the standard reward produces, it's more conductive to learning. It, it's worth digging deeper, kind of behind the math, this is reporting empirical results. The, so the third question we ask is, okay, if I have fixed budget, should I spend my time doing hyperparameter tuning or should I do a reward search? So all the studies that we had, we sorted based on the uh, objective value. And basically this says that under fixed objective, you're more likely to get better policy faster doing reward search with the caveat that you start with the reasonable hyperparameters. If your hyperparameters are completely off, then you're off. So that's the outer rel. Evolution determines. Go ahead. So in outer rel, when you, in the first stage, when you're mm -hmm. um, fine tuning the reward function, like how do you select hyperparameters there? Is that? So we got it of the baselines. Yeah. So the hyperparameter search that we had was doing the hyperparameter search. And on the outer rel, we used the baseline, the, the hyperparameters that are of the baseline. So the, it affects their worse. That's a good question. Okay, so the evolution determines the internal rewards that enable agent to learn the task, and then reinforcement learning learns the task. So combine them together and get better policies with less engineering, which is kind of, we're going for scalability. So we're talking about the most basic navigation skill. It's feasible, set of feasible actions to get to a nearby goal. Next question is, what is a most basic long range navigation skill? So if I need to go home now, right, what is that skill? And basically we can roughly de define it as a sequence of feasible waypoints that lead to our longer goal. And going between these waypoints is again, we're dealing with whatever comes our way. <laughs> no, noise and all and obstacles and so on. So 
PRMRL algorithm. We change policies for, and as I said, the auto RL policies we now have are running for fetch. They're running for uh, car, so the, the, the car robot dynamics, uh, luggage robot, and also asteroid, which I don't have pictures so the asteroid dynamics. It can actually solve point to point uh, for the complex dynamics. Robot. So we do, we pre train that agent, it learns how to go from A to B. Now if I'm going to put it in a new building, we get the map from the, for, for the mill building, and then we do sampling-based planning. You guys familiar with sampling-based planning? Yeah, no, maybe, okay. <laughs> at, at, at a high level, I get the space, and I randomly sample my waypoints. And they're either valid or they're not valid. I discard the non-valid parts, and then I try to connect these samples that I have and the, re the way the classic method uses a local planner, which is typically just a straight line geometry. So if I can fit through the space, I'm good to go. I can connect these spaces. What it doesn't look at is the dynamics of the robots and the noise and so on. So this variant, PRMRL, instead of using the straight line, we use our reinforcement learning policy, which is point-to-point -point policy. We do a Monte Carlo rollouts and only connect the samples that can be consistently connected with that policy. So the effect is then that that roadmap, once we have it, is tuned to the abilities of the, that particular robot. If the robot can't fit between the two spaces either because of the dynamics, noise, or whatnot, these two are not going to be connected. And each robot will have slightly different maps, even if you sample the same thing. The, and then once at the runtime, we find the, the nearest sample in the roadmap, find the path, and then provide that as a set of goals to the waypoint. So here, for example, this is using a SLAM map. These two are not connected, and the reason is if you zoom in, there is actually a pole here in the building. If you actually go physically, there is a pole and the robot cannot consistently fit between the pole, that's why that's not connected, even though geometrically it would. The, the second thing, now when we do this, we actually close the sim to real gap. Our simulation results are the same as, or the success rates are the same as in reality, because the uncertainty is baked in into reinforcement learning policy and so on. So that means that we can reason in the, in the in the simulation space and, and say something reasonable about it. The downside with that is that to build a bigger roadmap, it takes something like the order of 100,000 of edge connections. These are expensive because now we're doing a Monte Carlo rollout. The samples are uh, randomly sampled. They're not ideal, so the paths are zigzagged and so on. So connection step is expensive. So how can we do better, right? The, can we sample the candidate waypoints? And out of all the waypoints that can connect, normally you do this by the nearest neighbor, right? And there is some heuristics and so on. The, can we get them down to the most relevant? Maybe couple, reduce the possible search to a couple of magnitudes, and then do the connections. The key question here is, can we do this autonomously? Can we practice that skill, reflect on it, and get better in planning? So I'm going to give several examples to that effect. So the idea here is that I practice running my policy in SIM. I observe sensors and I observe metric. That creates my data set. Then I can train the predictor for that particular metric, given the sensor observation and the task that I'm trying to do and then use that in new environments that I haven't seen before to select the most relevant samples. And the particular metrics here of interest are feasibility, efficiency, safety, and the importance of the samples. So let's look at examples. So first one is time to reach or the reachability. This is the idea. If I need to exit this room and I'm standing here I can go and practice and can say, okay, it takes me three seconds. Fine. The same task, I'm trying to exit this room and you guys are also trying to leave this room. 
this is going to take me considerably longer, right? And I can practice that and find out, okay, that's a 15 seconds, that's a longer task. And I'm associating the experience of actually having tried that with the current sensor observations. You guys are sitting or you guys are walking here and going there to where I need to, to be. So next time when I'm in a different auditorium or a different room and I'm having similar situation, I can say, hmm, this is an easy task or this is a hard task or this, this is reachable or this is not reachable. Does that make sense? The, another example is because this works for, for the car uh, dynamics or the asteroid is that if I ask you to parallel park the car, that's a more harder problem than just going straight. But then if I have a wall right in front of me, then that's much a harder task. So that's what we do. We learn this predictability. So this on the right side is the ground truth. It's the time it would take to reach the center point in this new previously not seen environment. And basically means that this is harder. And this is the learned model. It's conservative. But that's actually a good thing in this case. The, that means that here in the vicinity around the point, it's going to be pretty accurate to tell me, yeah, this is feasible or this is not feasible for the complex. That, that, that includes the, the sensors and the dynamics and so on. So then I can put it into something like RRT, where if you guys are familiar with the RRT algorithm, it needs to solve a two-point boundary problem function, which is not generally available to many dynamic systems. You can kind of have it for, for very simple ones. Turns out RL can solve it and you can drive the system. So that's why the green trajectory, that's the RLRT that's using RL as a, as a steering function is smooth versus this is the ST standard one that does not. And the second one is that the search is connecting the samples in the RRT that are most feasible and reachable at a time. So we get shorter paths and faster planning. And this is developing the tree. Mm -hmm. So reachable here um, is reachable picking up particular time horizon? Um, given this it, it predicts time to reach the goal. And then if the goal is unreachable, there is the maximum of, I don't know, what we said 40 seconds, 60 seconds. So if you get it's going to be 60 seconds, means, yeah, we're not going to. Because so it's a local connection. So the output's a scaler, which is the time. Yeah, yeah. These RRT branches are then of different time steps in the RL RRT. Mm -hmm. So these branches in RL RRT mm -hmm. are of, like different time horizons. Yeah, so you can kind of go and you stop it after a certain time and find the second sample. So this is on the robot again. This is naive planning and we're having the waypoints that are off. And this is the RT trajectory that's going pretty smooth because it's picking samples closer. The second metric is swept volume. And swept volume roughly measures the efficiency of the motion. It is the volume of the displacement that the motion makes. And it's something that is heavily used in traditional motion planning as a heuristic to say, hey, if my motion or path is minimizing the displaced volume, then I'm less likely to get in collision and that's a good thing, right? The caveat with the swept volume is that it requires heavy computational geometry calculations and it's very slow. Turns out neural networks can learn it really well. From kind of examples, I think we need something like 100,000 examples for a variety of the robots. We can train the swap volume and then we do RT planning that minimizes the swap volume. And that's what you have on the left here with the Baxter, whereas the Euclidean distance measure goes and produces much longer paths. Is that the swap volume of the end effector or the entire arm? Oh, the entire arm. The, and I don't have video in the presentation, we have it in the paper that we can actually now learn to predict the volume of the space, so the grid cells that are being affected. And works for manipulators, prismatic joints, uh, arms, and so on, generally 
generalizes across the robots. Third metric that's inefficient generally is, and collision checking is a big part of, collision checking is the atomic action that happens in the planning. We always need to check whether we're in collision and so on. And intuitively here, we can, if I have a fixed space and the objects, right, then I should just know by knowing the positions of my joints and where I am based on my pose, whether I'm in collision with something or not. If this standing thing is here, and if I'm doing this thing, I should basically be able somehow to learn and feel the, the environment, right? I don't need to do computational geometry every single time. What's more, we can parameterize the environment and say, hey, if this thing moves here and you just give me the center of the mass of that object and I know my position, I should know whether this pose should be in collision or not. So that's, that's the intuition here. So we can see the 11 degrees of freedom, robot planning to basically get here to the duck. The, so the training collection, this basically creates, generates the data set, different poses, the shells move and so on. And that's how we train the method. And then we're putting it into RRT that does a massively parallel planning of because we're using the batching property of the neural networks, we can check entire edges at a time, 5,000 at a time to do collisions. They're gonna lie sometimes, but then we have a repair step that actually runs the full collision checking traditional method in uh, just for the repairs to verify that the paths are clear, but that's much smaller number of collision checks. The last one on the on kind of the space of the metrics is deals with a long long range navigation. So if I ask now I need to go back down to mountain view from here. What is my next thing to do? First thing to do. Where should I go first? Your car. Door. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter where I'm going to go, but in this space locally, there are certain spots that are important for longer range navigation, right? And these are locally learned. You go to a different space and based on my different geometry and dynamics and so on, if I'm a mouse, I might be looking for a mouse trap, but I'm not. I'm going to be looking for doors, right? These are things that we can learn locally and then plan and make our maps more efficient down the road. So that's basically the idea. We're gonna observe the important waypoints in the neighborhood, given the neighborhood and the point, the neighborhood is basically top-down projection here. Uh, we're gonna create a better roadmap. So first is we create, do a, build a PRM, like we did this actual PRM RL. For so this is a Googleplex, large map, that is used as the standard non-optimized non, uh, non uh, planning. Then we kind of go and solve a bunch of queries here. And we compute for each node in that roadmap, A, how many times we traverse to that node. That will tell us importance. And then if we remove that node, does the connectivity of the space still remain. And if both conditions hold, that means that this point is really important and we should note that. So that becomes our, so here on the Google Plex, there are these four walkways. Turns out things like entering into the whole walkway and going along them are important. There are a couple of main areas here, but here in the corner it's not as important. So that tells us how important the points are. And we can use then, so we can learn to predict these based on about five by five meters neighborhood top down of what is important for the sample. So now that we know that, how do we plan? We have new environments, we densely sample the space. Then we, for each sample, we kind of look at the neighborhood and says, hey, predict me how important the sample is. Turns out this one is important. These orange ones are not necessarily and so on. 
and we filter them. We only con uh, keep the log n important samples. And then we build a hierarchical load roadmap. The critical samples are connected globally and non-critical ones are connected locally. So back to me going home is that means that any points I have here locally in the room are only be connected to the room points in the room. They're going to be connected to the door. And then if there is another door. If I get to the hallway, there are going to be three other doors. I'm going to be connecting them separately. And we end up with a hierarchical roadmap. So this works for a variety. So for example, in this simple environment where we have slids here, the roadmap that covers the same space is two orders of the magnitude smaller. The, it works on the 3D. For the 3D, we use 3D convolutions. For the 2D space, we do 2D convolutions. Works on the uh, SC2 and SC3 robots as well. And then back on the navigation, in a brand new environment, we haven't seen a, this environment before, we see the critical samples are here and they look reasonable. The, and this is on the robot in the test bed. The, on the right side is the non-optimized and this is the critical point. It goes directly to where it needs, where this one kind of goes and spends time. And if you see closely, there are some extra waypoints here that are not present in the critical PRM, which is much more optimal. All right, so we're talking about acting and sensing in the auto RL and how it creates better policies with less engineering and that it bakes in robot dynamics and sensors. We talk about the loop between acting and planning and that it learns to estimate feasibility, safety, and efficiency for the new tasks with the respect of the abilities of the robot and the policy that we have at hand. And then with the planning, we saw that there is a faster, we can get to the faster and more efficient longer range planning that are within the robot's abilities. So now we have genetic algorithms, reinforcement learning, and self-supervision working together to basically improve the planning over time just from the experience. And we can work separately on the genetic algorithms. They're going to produce better rewards. We can learn separately on the reinforcement learning algorithms that are going to learn faster. We're going to learn better self-supervision models and so on. They're going to improve and create better planning. So we can work across all three dimensions independently and they can all improve the entire system. So these should be actually times here instead of pluses. <laughs> okay, so what about the curriculum of skills? And I need to speed up. So this is a sequence of the progressively harder tasks. And I'll go quickly through this. The, we go into the domain of the web navigation. And say if we say something, hey, book me a flight from, I think this is, Wichita, Arkansas, no, no Ark, to uh, London on October 25th. It's a fairly complex task. We need to know which, uh, which, uh, which airport is from, which two, to select the right two field and so on. It's a discrete problem. So previous work, uh, had, there was a data set of these mini environments that came with the uh, expert demonstrations. The expert demonstrations were needed for every single environment. And this is environment. They're f fairly simple, like very atomic things. Even with the expert demonstrations, flight booking with the supervised learning was not successful. So we're going to use the reinforcement learning in DQN in this case. And first we're going to create a curriculum DQN that if the demonstrations are available. The reason we need demonstrations is that the sparse reward is not going to get us anywhere. So instead, the reward is going to use the demonstrations and count the delta basically from the demonstration as a signal tool. And if the demonstrations are not available, then we're going to train a meta trainer that produces new demonstrations for the environment. And that's going to be a generative model. 
So the curriculum here is that we populate the website and then with a probability P, we remove certain fields. So at the very beginning, we have few fields that are not populated, maybe just one, and then an agent learns to do that field. Then we start kind of de decaying the probability and the, the task becomes more and more complex over time. So this is, on the second one is, now if we don't have demonstrations available or they're not, there is not enough demonstrations, we're gonna train a trainer. Basically the idea here is that any website or any field in the website is some instructions. And the idea here is to recover what is the hidden instructions that where this is a solution for. That's the rough idea. And we can make a generative model of, of the trainer to produce the environments. The looking into the comparison with the previous methods, just doing the Q learning with the expert demonstrations solves all of them even with the, we don't need the augmented rewards. We don't need the, we can just use the sparse reward and reinforcement learning is gonna outperform the, outperform the supervised learning. For the social media environment, which is one of the harder ones, that the previous methods could not even attempt to solve it, putting the augmented rewards actually does help and solve it. However, this does not help with the flight learning environment. So in the flight learning, uh, we see that the curriculum brings, brings a large improvement. We get 100% actually if we have the, the expert demonstrations. If we don't have expert demonstrations, we get up to 99%. And basically the reason is that our meta trainer is wrong. It's wrong 4% of time, it lies to you, gives you wrong, <laughs> leads you the wrong way, usually confuses the, the to and from dates, but yet we get up to 99%. So the moral of the story is that curriculum lift the, lifts the performance there is no substitute for the expert, and if you don't have an expert, train one. So, curriculum develops better skills. Now let's talk about the real robots. Some robots have lots of compute power, many don't, right? And mostly we've been talking in this uh, world of the environments and data sets, and completely ignoring what's happening, what's the compute system available on the robots. The, can we look the whole stack together? This is collaboration with uh, systems architects from Harvard. We released error learning uh, simulator that is specifically designed for the UAVs. It builds on the AirSim, the simulation environment from Microsoft and adds the interface to the OpenAI gym and uh, adds the environment generator that you can say, hey, I want 10 obstacles here, randomly position them and they are photorealistic and so on. So research pattern for hardware. So we have the, this section where we're creating the environment. So we can train uh, reinforcement learning policy for basically again doing the point to point that here is the curriculum over zones. So we start first training within the zone and that's the first checkpoint and we can validate it across the checkpoints. Once it's so proficient enough in zone one, we can extend to zone two and so on and we can learn obstacle avoidance on the, on the quad rotor. The second part is now you're gonna plug this on the quad rotor. It has a completely different compute and you're gonna crash your, your robot and then you need to fix it and that's not good, right? So what this allows is something that's called hardware in the loop. You're able to plug in the processor from your UAV into the SIM and see in the SIM how it's gonna perform on that pro target processor. That's what it looks like. <laughs> so the simulation does the rendering and all that stuff happens on the desktop and then the, the actual, the policy runs on this tiny chip. And then we can study the whole system together, right? So let's look at the Intel Core i7 processor and Raspi. 
the little ones, there is a big cost difference, right? There is a big speed difference and so on. The, the latency is huge. So latency on the time it takes to, to in, do inference of the model on the Intel is uh, three milliseconds, or 68 on the Raspberry Pi. And basically, normally you find this out by running it on a robot and crashing it, <laughs> <laughs> which is not ideal. But here you can actually, and you can see how the trajectory is different. The Raspberry Pi, the Intel one looks pretty smooth going between these points. This one is very jiggity jag, and you can see that in sim, and you can do something, you can improve it, add the latency to your model, and so on. So there's actually 38 difference between. Then the next question is, okay, can we do something useful with this? Can we train a moth, essentially? Can, <laughs> can we train a little crazy fly that has all nine kilobytes of available memory? to go and search for the light. The, we added laser ranges on four sides and a custom light sensor. And it weighs whole 33 grams or one ounce. And the total hardware cost is under $300. This is our DQN. The, it is discrete. So we're just going forward, right, and left. And goes then to a controller that executes these motions. Then we go and do a quantization and we shrink the model down to three kilobytes. And then it runs on the robot. It's a fully autonomous. And it goes and has, I think, 90% success rate on finding the light source. The 10% time that it doesn't is because 80%. The, there is not enough gradient in the light source to detect where it should be going and finding. So that's it. The, we covered diverse fleet of robots. We have a set of methods that work across different dynamics, different sensor modalities, and work towards sensing, acting, and planning together including the software and hardware design. And that all goes towards improving navigation with the experience on real robots. There is lots of work to be done. What are the right metrics to do? This is one way. It's not the only way, right? This is, this is a research in progress. <laughs> We're not building a product and so on. Uh, there might be very different ways, but this is exciting progress, at least for me. In the process, we can potentially help lots of people in a way. And I'd like to thank my collaborators and thank you guys. Questions for Alexandra? So um, speaking of sim to real, um, your experience of like, I guess, learning on, like for the, for the navigation or for uh, the, I guess the RL and the auto RL for the navigation of the, uh, the fetch robot and the ones like it, you mentioned, you know, like, and there's complications of like um, dealing with the kinematics of the robot and dealing with sensor noise. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk, I guess, about um, how much like the sensor noise, uh, et cetera, I guess, like what the realism of the sensor noise and that sort of thing in the mo in the simulation environment and as well like I guess quanti quanti uh, quantitatively like if that's you know taken away if the sensor noise model is not as realistic does it make everything how much does it make everything worse? So we started this very naively and our noise models are huge. I think we were adding like one meter of localization noise to the robot, which is ridiculous. So all these results are with that, let's pick a number and just add a random noise into the, the system. We could go and measure, and we did some actually, okay, let's run a robot and measure what the actual noise is for that particular one, and let's fold it in. I don't think we have these results. I don't think we actually did it. I mean, this is one of the things you decide what you're going to do and where you're going to prioritize. But it's definitely something that can, if I was designing a real system, right, and running on a real system, that would probably be the first thing. Let's go get the data 
learn what the standard mean and standard deviation for the noise are and kind of use that. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I was a little confused on the critical PRM. Mm -hmm. um, after you designate a node as critical, what does that enable you to do? Exactly? It, it, the, it connects it globally to any other no, node. So, so, the, so is the idea you build a bunch of local maps and then? Pretty much, we end up with a hierarchical. hierarchical. Like it's to minimize the time of trying to connect nodes between local maps? It's to minimize or, the, building, the build time and to minimize the number of nodes that's needed in between. Okay. The, so if I'm only connecting the local, in the, in, in the standard sampling base, you're only gonna uh, connect to, to the nearby nodes. And then as you kind of move through the space, that basically locality is gonna remain uniform. But here we have a special nodes that are connect that we're going to attempt to connect to all of them. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. And okay. that kind of ends up bringing a you, you kind periodical. of get smoother paths, I guess, yeah. since you're going yeah. to the. Yeah. And and you can stop sampling sooner because your connectivity of the space is suddenly going to become so that that's how you end up with a fewer samples. Hopefully, this isn't too similar to a question, but like. How, can you talk a little bit about how you determine like which points in that reduction are critical versus like which ones you're gonna? So when we're training, when we're gathering the data set, we go and traverse environments, so I'm going, going. and as I'm executing these paths, I'm keeping a track of how much, how many times I visited each node. And if I remove that node, can I still get to my destination? And that kind of determines, the two numbers put together determine how important that sample is. So I guess kind of related uh, to the finding important waypoints, it seemed like in the graph you showed of like which uh, points were picked out, that sometimes if there's like a narrow passageway where there's only one option, then all the stuff along that passageway would get designated as critical. Yeah. Is there, like, is, is that desirable or would it be preferable to find some way to only get like the ends of the corridor? Potentially in the future, the idea here is to have an automated way to do that. The, and the key here is that that sample is not only important, like it's also important that it's feasible. So sometimes, we, especially with the, the kinodynamic systems, asteroid and so on, if you're going around the corner, being able to kind of slid in and turn into is not easy thing to do. So that that sample is put ahead of the hallway, for example, or very slightly in where you can actually shoot, that's what's important getting it better and optimal and so on. We just send this for a crown Sunday, so. <laughs> It's, it's about the same, and that was very interesting. The Mujako environments, I was hoping they would train faster. Yeah. They didn't. Mm -hmm. So each one of the agents was taking, I don't know, 10, 12 hours to train. And PPO was actually the slowest. PPO was, we don't have as much data on the PPO because it was taking a very long time. Hi, so in your um, like training loop, you both evolved the rewards and you evolved the neural network architectures. How important is the actual evolution of the neural network architectures? Good question. The, for, on DDPG, the neural network architecture prevented DP, DDPG from having the catastrophic forgetfulness. And we also trained, so I was talking about the point-to-point -point task. The other task we trained this on was path following. So if I have robots with the dynamics, if I give you waypoints, can I follow them? Turns out that that one was very sensitive to the size of the goal. So if I, how many waypoints I give, how spaced they are, and how big they are. 
And that was very difficult until we started doing the reward search, which is really macro decision process parameters here, things were not working. The neural network search made it better. On the Mujako tasks, we did some experiments on the neural network search. The improvements was not as big. So that ended up not being in a paper. It does improve, but it wasn't a huge deal. Thank you. But training was going a lot slower with the neural networks. Yeah. So, okay, I have a question about, I don't remember what you called it, but the clearance RL or something yeah. like that. Um, so what, what kind of speed up did you see from doing that? And how did you decide, you said you had to go back and do a pass to like fix uh, mm -hmm. segments that you weren't sure about. Mm -hmm. How do you decide which ones not to be sure about? So the speed ups in building, it was getting, Again, we we'll sent the paper on Sunday. That, that one also went on Sunday. <laughs> the, the planning on the path that I showed there, the planning, uh, the, the trajectory execution that was, we're seeing about 20% improvement on the length of the paths that are produced. In terms of the planning time, the speed ups were, depending on the environment, because we're doing the uh, couple of mobile manipulators, the fetch environment and so on, they were also going against, I don't know, 70% or 50, 60%. It was significant. How we do, so we do, we build this roadmap or the RRT with best belief or like using the learned collision, which might or might not be true. So then once you kind of connect to the goal, you have your path. Now we go and try and we go and for that path that was selected that we think is gonna be feasible, we go and actually do traditional computational geometry method. And that's gonna say, hey, on this segment here, you have a collision. Fine, now that I have this edge, I need to repair that edge. So I'm gonna run a bunch of smaller traditional methods. So the to, paths you get at the end are always guaranteed to be collision free. Yeah, they, they are at the end, the, but we have that repair step. Okay, yeah. that's just kind of to, yeah. yeah. And you have that one-time cost of the actually checking the validity check. Any other questions? All right, if there are no other questions, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.